right, let's get started. So traditionally in HPC, it's all, um, most of HPC is actually bare metal and then some cloud nowadays, but uh, even now, uh, after a lot of, uh, lot of years of virtualization, even now there's only like 20% of HPC is virtualized. And uh, when people talk about virtualizing HPC, they look at two different, two different um, pieces. Sometimes the, they, they think containers and virtual machines are competition to each other. They feel that they either need to go containers or they need to go virtual machines. It's not both, right? So today my job here is to show you why um, marrying the two it actually makes sense. So last year I did a project with uh, uh, the Scilabs folks and uh, some of the results we, uh, we will discuss at the end of this presentation. So initially what I'm going to do is actually go through some of the core features of virtualization because it is important and those features are the ones that uh, what do you call uh, a virtual machine brings to bear in the equation and in the end, since you guys are all singularity folks here, um, I don't need to go into too much details on what kind of advantages singularity brings, but I'm gonna show you how kind of having both together helps. So what we are gonna look at is, you know, as you know, there's a lot of advancements in hardware of late. So a lot of things are changing, um, GPUs are in prominence, there are a lot of acceleration technologies out there. Uh, how many of you heard of the Mellanox acquisition today? So, big one, right? So, fact that NVIDIA is buying a high-speed networking company uh, shows that a lot of these technologies are coming together. So, we look, we look at that, we look at how a virtual machine is able to use these technologies and how VMware is keeping up with that, and then we look at how we can bring singularity into the picture, right? So, so you, you, all these things, uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of these things happening here, and then uh, these are all the specialized hardware, and then we have all these different kinds of applications that are uh, coming together, and like big, a uh, lot of the traditional HPC is able to leverage uh, IT kind of apps and and vice versa, a lot of the technologies that are HPC only in the past is also able to leverage uh, leverage the, the HPC side. And so kind of this is kind of a picture that from a VMware standpoint we look at, and a lot of customers are running some things in the cloud, some things on-prem, and then there's a hybrid of things because some things can, from a security standpoint, you don't want to run in the cloud or performance reasons, cost reasons. And then last but not the least, if you're gonna run all of these, security is very important. Right. So what, what, do, what does uh, VMware and virtual machines bring to the fore here? So, so the fact that that's, a lot of the things that a container does, actually a virtual machine also does. You're encapsulating an app, uh, you're encapsulating an OS into a file. So all those things actually initially started with virtual machines and then containers uh, took it to the next level, right, where you're able to encapsulate the entire app and then be able to move the app around, right? And so also the agility comes from this ability to encapsulate and move things around. And then since uh, VMware and virtual machines have been there for more than 20 years now, there's a lot of technologies that have been built around it, like the ability to move... Uh, virtual machine from one physical node to another without having any downtime. The users are still using it and you're moving things around. Disaster recovery is very easy. Uh, high availability is like a no-brainer. So I, I come from the Unix world. I used to be a Solaris admin, IBM AIX admin. High availability used to be a real big pain to set up. It used to be really hard. Uh, VMware, uh, for example, vSphere, it's, very, it's just a click of a button. You, it, it, it's all set up in the back end. If any virtual machine or any host running a virtual machine goes down, it automatically comes up in the infrastructure. So, so all these things, those are, that's, that's, what I, that's what we call as enterprise class virtualization. So we want to bring all of this into the, into the new class of applications and containers that, that are now the, 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 the things that are now that are popular right now, right? So to bring, to bring these new capabilities, um, so 
we kind of look at all these different advantages, right? So there's a lot of operational flexibility. In the traditional HPC world, you had dedicated clusters for different applications, and then the, the different teams used it, but there was no cross-pollination, and a lot of the infrastructure was underutilized. And so what VMware hopes to bring to, to the fray is ability, better operational flexibility, complexity is also reduced because everything is centrally managed, and uh, you're able to kind of uh, deploy virtual machines which, uh, which, uh, which are equivalent to what you had in a bare metal environment, but at the same time, you're able to move things around, uh, scale up, scale down, scale out, whatever you, your application needs, which is not really possible in a bare metal environment. And then the last but not the least is security, right? When we put all these different departments or applications together, uh, you, you, uh, you don't want uh, these teams to see each other's data necessarily. So security is a big part of it. So we, uh, we also do our security through software defined, everything is software defined. Storage, networking, compute, everything is software defined. So the flexibility and the, and the scalability comes from that. So when we look at some of the technologies that are there and how VMware does it to show you why a virtual machine is still relevant and, is, is a, and it, it is able to give you the performance and the capabilities of a bare metal infrastructure at the same time gives you the flexibility that comes with it, right? So this is one of the common ways and people complain about performance when you move from bare metal to virtual environment, they'll say, will I get the same performance? And particularly accessing high performance devices, high performance networks, infinite band networks, and stuff like that. So uh, GPU cards, whatever you have in your infrastructure. So we have this concept called VM Direct Path IO, where you actually, the hypervisor is not, is not in between your virtual machine and your hardware. It is able to talk directly to the hardware. There is no driver in the hypervisor. The hypervisor just passes through everything. So there is, uh, we've shown through a lot of our studies and performance studies that there is uh, minimal performance difference from a bare metal environment to that of uh, something that's using this, right? So, so this is, uh, if you really are performance sensitive and don't really care much about sharing, this is the way to go. You want to be able to leverage the flexibility of a virtual machine. At the same time, you are uh, getting the performance you usually have. So the other aspect you guys are probably familiar with is SRIOV, so we support SRIOV, where we can actually have multiple virtual machines share a hardware device. The thing about SRIOV is the mobility is still not there. That means uh, SRIOV acts within the physical boundaries of a server. And so things like infinite band, RDMA, or in Ethernet, uh, and then ether, uh, Ethernet and all those things can be can be split, uh, multiple VMs in a particular host can share this infrastructure, but the downside is no vMotion. And vMotion, as I mentioned, is the ability to move a VM from one, one physical host to another without any downtime, right? But it is available. So what it gives you is that you can share devices. Not all your virtual machines need the entire device sometimes, so you're able to share them. right? And then the next important concept is obviously RDMA. RDMA is... Uh, uh, becoming more and more important with the, because of the high-speed capabilities it provides without the overhead that TCP IP has. So um, you guys will probably be familiar with it, and a lot of, uh, lot of the latencies that are associated with traditional networking is not there in RDMA, and it's slowly um, you know, diffusing into all these areas like storage, HPC, business analytics, machine learning. And like things like 100 gigabit Ethernet, uh, Rocky, you're able to use, you're able to leverage RDMA to kind of uh, have memory level, or um, you know you can actually remotely access GPUs and stuff like that because of RDMA, right? So, uh, so in this space, uh, we see like how does it do it? You know, it, it's uh, it's basically bypassing the TCP/IP layer, and then gives you a direct connection to the device. So and uh, it gives you reliable transport and address translation. So it's very, very relevant in the HPC world. At the same time, it, uh, it, is, uh, it, it, provide, it keeps up with all the latest technologies and the hardware out there. And 
leveraging RDMA gives you the ability to share infrastructure. You're able to share the infrastructure uh, much easier because now we have a high-speed interconnect with low latencies, right? So one thing that we have done from a VMware standpoint is called PVRDMA. So when you do, for example, in SRIOV, I mentioned that machines can move from one, other, one place to the other. That machine has, is physically bound to a particular physical hardware. With PVRDMA, what we have is you can actually move. Uh, you can have something use a uh, RDMA, and we can move the machine from one physical host to another without, uh, you know, so without uh, any downtime. So, so PV stands for para-virtualized. A lot of the st hardware stuff we do, when we do para-virtualized, we get pretty much identical performance to bare metal, but we add the ability to kind of have a virtualization layer so that things can move around. So now, obviously, this is the hot, hot area. And so some of the work we did with Singularity was GPU-related. So we'll talk a little bit about it, right? So um, obviously, GPUs, uh, all of, most of you are familiar with. The, the biggest difference on why GPUs are used is um, GPUs were initially in the, in the area of use of graphics, right? And where there were a lot of pixel processing and mat matrix multiplication. A lot of the scientific workloads seem to be uh, able to use uh, similar compute capabilities that a graphic processing unit can provide. And the big thing about a graphic processing unit is that you have thousands of cores as opposed to tens of cores that you get in a traditional CPU. And so machine learning and deep learning, particularly deep learning, uh, is able to leverage GPUs because of, uh, of the latest uh, advances. Uh, and then the algorithms that, uh, like neural networks, kind of uh, do, the computations are pretty similar to what, uh, what uh, graphics processing can, can provide. And so that's kind of where you see this uh, in prevalence. Right? So we have things like uh, image classification, media analytics, uh, Monte Carlo simulations, financial modeling, all these can leverage GPUs. And so in, in the case of vSphere, we have worked with NVIDIA. We have a special driver. So what NVIDIA gives you, NVIDIA and VMware produce the software where you, uh, lot of, not, all of, not all organizations can give a GPU per developer or per, uh, per data scientist. So what NVIDIA grid, which is like what this, this, uh, this name, Quadro BDWS is the official name, but it's, uh, it's called NVIDIA grid. What it gives you is the ability to split up a GPU and give, give the GPU to multiple users. So in the case of uh, the NVIDIA grid, what NVIDIA is doing is actually splitting up the memory of the GPU. It's not splitting up the cores necessarily, but it, and what it gives you is now the, every user can get their own piece of GPU and are able to use it. And initially it started the, in the VDI space and the desktop space where a lot of graphics engineers were sh sharing GPUs and slowly evolved and now uh, the same concept is applicable to high performance computing and machine learning as well. So what the benefits you can see, there's hardware isolation, there's workload isolation because VMs can give you all these capabilities. You have a quality of service, you have a quality of service at the VM level, at the GPU level, and you're able to provision a lot of VMs and give a lot of developers access to GPUs very easily. So the, the other aspect, as I mentioned, I talked to, talk to you about um, RDMA, right? So these high-speed interconnects now give you the capability of having your GPU not located on your physical server. The GPU can actually be located over the network. But that, that, that means that you need a very low latency, high-speed interconnect. So the RD, RDMA or Rocky gives you that capability. So some of the experiments we did we actually uh, are able to, so the beauty of this is you can, have, uh, you can have your data center where there are a lot of virtual machines and a lot of servers. Only a subset of your servers have GPUs on them. So those GPUs are actually served by the bottom layer here. And we, let's say we create something called a GPU cluster. And any, any of the other nodes in the cluster, which, are, which might not, or might, those servers might not have any GPUs in them, they're able to use the GPU. They're, going to, they're able to go through RDMA and use the GPU. So it kind of gives you the flexibility and uh, kind, kind of gives you like a, 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 the functionality and the flexibility. Obviously, you're going to lose some performance. You're going over the network. But 
but some what we're going to show you over time is that the, the 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 flexibility is way more important than the performance you lose so bitfusion is a company that does that and then uh, uh, they are a third party company that uh, has a client server model so the bottom is like the server and you need to in install something called a bitfusion client and then the bitfusion client is able to communicate with the server and get the gpu resources it needs Okay, so we we did a couple we did a couple of projects. One of this project I'll talk show you is a, a virtual machine project. The next machine next project is a, a singularity container project. They're pretty identical, but uh, I'll show you the benefits from each of them. Right. So in this case, what we have we have we're using TensorFlow RNN. We have a, one, a bunch of supermicro dual twelve core systems, uh, sixteen gigabit NVIDIA P one hundred GPU. Uh, we have uh, two VMs with 8Q profile. What does an 8Q mean? Uh, when a 16 gig NVIDIA card can be, uh, with NVIDIA grid, every VM can get this own. Uh, if you divide the GPUs across multiple virtual machines, they have to be all equal. They don't allow you to have one, one VM have two gig of GPU, the other one have eight gig of GPU. So in this case, we had, they allow, they have to be equal. So we have two VMs with eight, gigabytes of GPU profile each. We ran the NVIDIA grid and uh, we have different scheduling policies. What are these scheduling policies, right? Um, so those are for the cores actually, the scheduling policies. A fixed share is where every VM is given a fixed share of the cores. Equal share, every VM getting given an equal share. Fixed share, where do you use it? If you are a service provider and you're providing, somebody's paying for the GPUs, you, you, you give them a fixed share and then they can use it. If they don't use it, it's not used by anyone else. Equal share is when every, everybody gets equal priority, and best effort is where, you know, whoever needs it gets it, right? And so what we did in the next uh, screen you see here is we ran two jobs on those two VMs. One is a short-running job. The, the bottom, the black uh, job is a short-running job. The, it is, as you see, it's using around 35% of the GPU to begin with. And the bottom job, or the top job is using 65%, and this is best effort. So what happens is over time, the, when the bottom job dies out, the top job gets the whole GPU. So that's kind of one of the, some of the core benefits, right? So when, when you share like this, uh, you are able to give your developers GPUs on their own, but at the same time, when nobody is using it, you're able to leverage it. So that's kind of what this, search, this shows. And this kind of, uh, this is why as you, as you, VMware as a platform itself has been so popular over time is because you're able to kind of best use your, utilize your hardware to the fullest because when nobody else is using it, you get to use it. When everybody is competing for resources, you're able to tell them, you're able to kind of create limits and set limits on uh, infrastructure so that they get what they, what they paid for. So now let's look at how we can uh, extend this to containers, right? So Singularity, as you guys, uh, this is a Singularity conference, you guys know well, what is different about it. The core thing is it is designed for HPC, Docker is not. Uh, Singularity containers, a single file, designed from the ground up for scientific computing. So I'm preaching to the choir, but that's kind of what Singularity brings. And since HPC, machine learning is in the HPC realm, it makes sense for us to run machine learning on Singularity. So now, what does combining these two give you? Okay, so if you look at a singularity container, and let's say you have a host on which your singularity container is running, how do you tell the host, give so much GP only, or so much compute only? You have a noisy neighbor problem. You have the resource contention. There's not, not good enough, what you call, resource allocation methodologies available in containers. If you look at it from a host perspective, Right, uh, any, any container can get whatever it wants to most extent. Right, the, what virtual machines give you is that capability to say these are your boundaries. You get so much memory, you get so much CPU, you get um, you get so much GPU. So we we saw the mechanisms where all the hardware can be split up and given to VMs. Right, imagine now taking a singularity container and putting that inside a VM. The VM has all these resource allocations available. And then you have, now your container gets the same resource 
capabilities that a virtual machine has. And so uh, you, have, you can have multiple singularity containers running on a particular host, uh, sharing GPUs just like a VM does, and you're able to kind of leverage, leverage all the capabilities of a virtual machine. At the same time, containers are a great packaging mechanism. Uh, uh, example I can give you is I did the same project on a virtual machine. It took me two days to build out all the software to run TensorFlow. It took me 30 minutes. Actually, a guy, Paulo from uh, Singularity, helped me 30 minutes. The Docker, uh, the, the, uh, the Singularity container was up and running. It was running the benchmarks in 30 minutes. So a huge difference. So being from the VM world, I know the pain of building templates and maintaining templates and all that. Singularity has solved that for us. VM, from a VMware standpoint, there is a pain for, for Singularity where, you know, am I able to allocate my resources, segregate my resources, provide the ability to share things that the VM gives you. So by combining these two, you have the best of both worlds. So, so now this is kind of what we did. Uh, we used Bitfusion. We had um, uh, a bunch of uh, hosts with GPUs in the bottom. Uh, we have we had singular uh, uh, virtual machine which is shown in green. The container singularity containers inside the virtual machine. One VM per container model, and uh, and then we kind of uh, this kind of a test environment we had uh, has a bunch of specs. Uh, this will be shared. We used Mellanox uh, 100 gigabit Rocky for our connectivity for our GPUs. So let's look at what uh, what kind of what we did here. Okay, so let me explain. So we did a baseline testing where I say, okay, one VM gets one GPU. Uh, one singularity container running inside a VM, we give it an entire GPU, and we run a bunch of uh, benchmarks and see how much images per second I'm getting. Then I create four virtual machines on the same host, give them quarter of the GPU, and then I run the same tests again. And I'm looking at, so when I'm doing the four, uh, four container test, I'm aggregating all the images. Let's say all four containers are working for me. I'm taking all those numbers and looking at the images per second and aggregating them. So when I did that, what we saw was we almost get two and a half to three X the number of images being processed. Let's assume that in the perfect world, you can distribute your job across multiple containers. If you can do that, here you see that you get for the one GPU, GPU is the most expensive resource. It's 8K a card or something compared to even even a CPU, right? It's, it's the most expensive. Is imagine you're able to get so much more juice out of your GPU than you would. So this is kind of an example. So the bottom is the baseline. These are very common uh, benchmarks that are run ResNet, AlexNet, and Inception. These are yes, okay. So these are the these are the models, and so these are uh, so you see that there's two and a half to three x improvement in performance, right? But obviously there is a penalty, right? When you're when instead of getting giving a full GPU to a VM and a container, you're giving only a quarter of a GPU, there's going to be some hit. That, that hit is going to be, the job is going to slow down. Okay, let's say if I have um, something processing um, images, right? If you look at it from a time perspective, there is a 17% that the same job runs 17% slower now because quarter of the, it's getting only quarter of the GPU and not the full GPU. But when you look at the advantage, I'm getting three times the throughput, I'm losing only 17%. So there are a lot of workloads in HPC that are batch-based, that are training models and stuff like that. They can, uh, you, by running more and scaling out, you're, uh, you're having more uh, VMs using the GPU, you're able to gain from it. So this was, uh, this is, I did with uh, Singularity folks last year, and this is, uh, was also presented in VMworld last year. So, in summary, now we showed that vSphere is a flexible platform. You're able to allocate all the resources you want um, in, in a very uh, granular fashion. Singularity uh, provides the most uh, you know, optimized container for HPC, as you know. We can package a singular applications like machine learning applications inside a container very easily, deploy them in half an hour like we, should, we saw in our own experiments. And hardware sharing through vSphere we saw can increase throughput, efficiency, and utilization. So my, uh, my initial uh, hypothesis of the stock was, you know, by marrying these two technologies, we can get a lot more out of it, and that's kind of what we saw in our experiment. Questions? 
Any questions for Mohan? Yeah, uh, regarding the last argument that uh, virtual machines are very good in sharing resources and containers are very good in packaging them. I mean, isn't the use of C groups with containers good enough in sharing resources? I, I, I can argue for virtual machines of, for other things. For example, the container needs to use the underlying kernel. So virtual machine has an advantage in this context. But for resource sharing, even, even with GPU, I think C groups could do the isolation well. To some extent, yes. And I actually didn't even mention that point where you can have multiple versions of your OS and containers running in a virtual machine compared to sharing the kernel issue. Yes, but it's not as evolved. Think of it this way, right? Virtual machines have evolved over so many years. And you also have the capability of moving things around. High you, I know that the container ecosystem and like Kubernetes and stuff like that gives you high availability. But a lot of the apps cannot, are, are like, let's say, a lot of the apps are single points of failure and stuff like that. So the virtual machine gives you that uh, all those capabilities as well. How uh, C groups can do that, but uh, not for all, all use cases. To avoid the confusion, I just want to clarify Abdul's point. Um, there was a proposal from AMD a few months back, I guess November, right after the LPC, to have a GPU resources exposing as a C group resource that hasn't been merged. Um, there is no, to my knowledge, there is no C group to tell that carve out this one GPU into four GPUs and give these four CPUs to four GPU cores to this container. We have a resource as a, as a CPU memory, RDMA and more. So, so there are, there is work happening in that area, but we are not there yet. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, in, in, in PBS, there is some sort of a specific management of GPU resources with the based on C groups. I didn't use it myself, but yeah, I, I know that it exists. So, uh, I mean, anyways, there is a direction for uh, having more advanced support of uh, GPU resources and uh, using C groups. So, Absolutely. Because, you know, the... the uh, addition of virtual machine, it means that you need to install the hypervisor, which is an additional layer, which makes, adds more complexity to the, to the system. So for use cases like this, I'm not sure if uh, this is an, a, a sufficient reason to go in this direction, because it, it's not as simple as, as it looks. Yes, but I, I agree, but if you, look at why, if you look at Kubernetes and why it's taken off, it gives you the orchestration and stuff like that. Uh, VMware as a company also is going in that direction to make Kubernetes a first-class citizen. So, so you see, uh, you, you, there is a need for a higher level orchestration and operation level. So right now, I, I, what I showed you was v, from a VMware standpoint, but if you look at it from a Kubernetes standpoint, a lot of these things are, will show up as well. You need something above to manage the containers, to be able to re allocate resources to the containers. Yes.